it's just a pleasure to introduce Monica Gandhi, um, someone that obviously needs no introduction to our group. Um, and we're just so excited to have you, Monica, and uh, so eager to hear about all your latest work in adherence measures with hair and, uh, and other uh, biospecimens. Uh, but Monica completed her medical training at Harvard University and then interned and fellowed and resident at uh, UCSF where she stayed on uh, as a faculty member uh, and has really just ascended in the ranks at UCSF in both her clinical and her research roles. She's currently the director of the HIV clinic at SFGH, uh, Ward 86, and she is the director of the CIFAR uh, at UCSF. So it's hard to know when Monica finds time to sleep, uh, but she does it all. Um, and the thing that I think is most, um, most positive about Monica is that she's so committed to mentoring and so committed to women's health. Uh, she's been a tremendous mentor to so countless faculty at UCSF, uh, including me. Uh, she worked with me on my first R1 and helped me figure out how to collect hair and uh, test for methamphetamine. And it's uh, just a pleasure to have you speak, Monica. Well, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Um, I think I remember when you invited me, Adam, and it was supposed to be October, and I was so excited that I got to fly to Miami and hang out with you. And now we're all on Zoom all the time. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about our work on adherence metrics. And I don't know, I mean, I'm very uh, happy to take questions now or at the end, whatever your usual is. Um, but I'm going to talk about hair and urine-based metrics to measure and support treatment and PrEP adherence, the long and short of it. And, um, you know, what I wanted to talk about at the beginning is the adherence issue is not unique to us alone uh, in HIV medicine. So the World Health Organization has declared that more people worldwide would benefit from efforts to improve medication adherence than from the development of new medical treatments. And non-adherence has been labeled America's other drug problem. And really only 51% of Americans treated for cardiovascular disease or diabetes are adherent to their therapy and about 50% of patients or 25 to 50 can discontinue statins within a year of treatment initiation. So it isn't just us, it's just that in HIV, we've been really, I think, ahead of the curve in thinking about objective metrics of adherence. And um, it costs a lot to society, non-adherence. It's a very behavioral issue. Um, it reminds me of masks, actually, like wearing facial masks. Like these are all behavioral things. You have to, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. So in terms of how we measure adherence, you know, it really ranges from more objective metrics to more subjective metrics. The easiest thing to do is to ask people. Um, and, you know, that self-report is uh, maybe the easiest, but it is, um, it is, can be unreliable in terms of that right-hand corner with the subjective measures. Patient diaries, pill counts, retrospective questionnaires, these are all more subjective measures. And then if we go up um, and to the more objective measures, they have advantages and disadvantages too, um, in terms of electronic monitoring, sensors, and then pharmacologic measures. And we'll be focusing more in this talk on the pharmacologic measures. Uh, in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of each, you know, self-report is cheap and widely available to what we do, but there are recall biases. There are social desirability bias to asking someone if they're taking their meds. Pill counts are easy, but you can just jump them down the toilet before you get there. Pharmacy refills are good, but they do require a closed system usually. And our fractured healthcare system here can be difficult with that. Certainly in HIV treatment, HIV RNA is the best way to measure adherence, but the problem is by the time you get to virologic failure, the cat may be out of the bag in terms of something that you could have prevented. And then MEMS caps, you know, they are widely used um, in our field. Uh, they do have this kind of um, issue that they're bigger. They can be uh, incompatible with pill boxes, which are helpful for adherence. And so, and in a way, um, there's a Hawthorne effect where you're, where, where you're both the outcome and the predictor is the actual MEMS cap. And then pharmacologically, we're going to spend a little, that's really what we're going to talk about are the different pharmacologic measures. And then, of course, the best thing to do is lock someone in a room and watch them take their medications, but that's not really feasible. Um, the directly observed therapies, you know, at least for PK studies is what we would do in a phase one trial, for example. 
So really what we're going to talk about in terms of the objective metrics is, you know, this philosophy that what gets measured gets managed. And why did we get so ahead of the, the curve, I think, in HIV medicine about starting to measure um, metrics of adherence? And it really was the prep field that launched that for us. Um, so, you know, it is, it is, um, it is not, it was, it was really the prep field, I'm actually going to skip this for a minute and go to here, is um, it was this field that surprised us so much in terms of what we needed to do for measuring adherence. So, of course, the IPREX um, uh, study was the first prep trial and uh, published in August 2010. And even there, the um, efficacy of prep in gay men was not as you know, good as we thought uh, by the macaque models um, and started to think about doing plasma measures of tenofovir. And when that happened, you could see that the efficacy was much higher in IPREX if you limited the analysis to those who had tenofovir in their plasma. And then certainly voice and femprep were really the two trials that revealed how incredibly important pharmacologic monitoring was to interpret these trials because these were trials that showed in young African women that um, PrEP didn't have efficacy, but yet the self-report in FemPrep and Voice was 91, 95% respectively, and even pill counts were high. And so going back in time, because you'd, you'd taken the plasma, people had taken the plasma for creatinine measurements and whatnot, um, we had that levels, these tenofovir levels, it was revealed that certainly it was really that there was, there was little, there was less than 30% adherence in the active arm to those who said they were taking tenofovir. So it really was adherent, was the etiology of those failure of those trials, and it was the objective metrics that made it so, um, that, that, that allowed the interpretation of those trials. So what I wanna talk about here then in terms of interpretation is pharmacologic measures. We're gonna start with like other pharmacologic measures that are used commonly. And then we'll focus on, on some work our, our, our lab has been doing, which is on hair measures and urine measures. So we'll, we'll spend more time on those as the long and the short, but let's go over the field of pharmacologic monitoring first. Um, so really what pharmacologic monitoring means is of course measuring a drug in a biomatrix. And so you can do plasma, you can do dry blood spots, you can do peripheral blood mononuclear cells, hair, urine, um, but the idea is that you actually measure the drug in the body to assess drug taking. And there's no other way for it to get in the body except through adherence. So in a way it is a um, kind of an integrated measure of both the behavior, which is adherence and drug taking, and biology, which is your pharmacokinetics. So the same person can take the same drug and have different levels. And um, as we talked about with the fem prep and voice trials, pharmacologic measures have proven essential in prep uh, because you really can't measure obviously an HIV viral load in those who don't have HIV. Um, but it is good and has been looked at for other strategies employing medications. And so TB um, infection monitoring, either latent or active TB um, has used uh, plasma and hair levels of TB drugs to monitor adherence. And um, we just talked about this slide, but it wasn't just in voice and fem prep, but in partners prep, uh, the efficacy increased. If you looked specifically at the subgroup that had active tenofovir plasma levels, and as we talked about in IPREX, really the efficacy of TDF FTC increased from 44% to an estimated 92%, looking just like it did in macaque models before this, if you restricted the analysis to those who had detectable drug levels with tenofovir. Actually, it was um, in plasma or PBMCs in that study. So the good thing about plasma levels is that they are readily available. You are collecting plasma as part of your trial or as part of clinical care, and you can measure tenofovir level, for example, in that plasma level. The, um, the uh, disadvantage is that your plasma levels vary day to day, and they can be all over the place, actually, uh, with a lot of intra-individual variability um, based on when you took your medication, if you took it at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. the night before, your level's gonna be different the next morning. Um, and you have to rely on when the patient self-report about taking that drug. And then also just day-to-day um, -day variation with food and 
um, uh, and like methamphetamine use or something else that you did that morning. So it really is, um, can have this um, significant variability. And that has raised interest in longer term metrics of adherence um, that don't have that day-to-day intra-individual variability. Now, the first way that this was really looked at was in the IPREX trial was using peripheral blood non- mononuclear cells because um, they were collected. They, they actually are hard to process. Um, it, does, it does add a lot of complexity to your trial and they're hard to measure, but PBMCs were used in both IPREX and IPREX OLE um, and tenofovir diphosphate levels were measured in PBMCs. The two metrics that have emerged as um, being more convenient for measuring drug levels in in the context of PrEP and treatment as well are dry blood spots because you can collect them and have them at room um, temperature for a while or uh, hair levels. And we'll talk um, a little bit about each of those, but they really are long. What happens is of course, tenofovir goes from the periphery into the dry blood spots, um, actually into any cell peripheral blood mononuclear cells or red blood cells, and it's processed inside the cell to tenofovir diphosphate. And so it's the metabolite of tenofovir that's measured in dry blood cells. Um, But in hair, it's actually tenofovir itself. And the reason that we're so interested in cumulative adherence is we, you know, the comparison is to like a single glucose level in diabetes monitoring versus hemoglobin A1C. A single glucose level is... um, you know, all over the place, depending on what you ate, but a hemoglobin A1C in treatment monitoring is a long-term metric of your long-term glycemic control. And the same idea with a hair level or a DBS level, that it's a longer cumulative metric. You can't fool the system by just taking it the day before and having that appear in your hair. It really um, is, is, is a cumulative hair adherence. So in terms of dry blood spots, you know, um, I think PBMCs are really difficult. They are difficult to process, isolate, challenging, but the dry blood spots have really emerged as a very useful metric. It's either, it's measuring actually both, both tenofovir diphosphate and then FTC, the metabolite of that is FTC triphosphate in dry blood spots. And the FTC triphosphate can give a shorter term metric of adherence and that tenofovir diphosphate is longer term metric. And the, there, there are many studies that use uh, D, uh, DBS um, as a metric of adherence in PrEP, and it's been very useful. There are a few issues. Um, this is only useful for medications that are processed intracellularly. So a dolotegravir level, for example, is not useful in a dry blood spot. It may be useful to collect a dry blood spot, but it's going to be no different than it is in plasma. It just measures a short-term metric of adherence. The only reason it works for tenofovir is because this intracellular metabolism occurs with tenofovir and FTC in dried blood spots. And then there are some issues with standardizing against hemoglobin, um, and there are differences um, uh, between men and women and between African-American and white patients that um, sometimes have to be taken into account. But overall, this has been a very successful measure in PrEP monitoring. Um, other sort of different ways to think about um, monitoring is, um, before we get to hair and urine, is, you know, there's been some very creative ways to monitor adherence. In the tepivirine vaginal ring trials, uh, beyond measuring t- tepivirine in plasma, the major metric of adherence in that study, in these studies of the vaginal ring, um, at least the, the phase three studies, were actually to take the ring itself and measure tepivirine in the ring, residual drug levels in the ring, because the more you use it, the more it should leach out. And so the lower your level in the, dr- in the ring, the higher your adherence to actually placing the ring in the cervix um, should be. And indeed, as shown by this um, graph on the right, your risk reduction was higher if you had lower drug levels in the ring. So that was a creative way to measure um, monitoring in the tepivirine ring trials, though it's it's a, it's a difficult way to do it, which is the silicone ring. And then a comment on MEMS caps is that they have been used a lot in our field in HIV treatment and, and um, pre-exposure monitoring. Um, they do, there are some advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it's not invasive. You don't have to take a blood level or cut something. But, and often the Wise pill and others have the wireless chips, so you don't need to go and download them um, Later, you can get the, the monitoring in real time by opening the cap and having, having that be monitoring. There is this sort of self-referential aspect that studies have shown that if you use a MEMS cap and then the outcome is actually MEMS, MEMS cap adherence, 
um, it is like you're using both the MEMS cap as, as this predictor and the outcome. And then you can open a, a pill bottle, but you don't have to take it. So there isn't that pharmacologic um, verification that you've actually taken the drug. Um, and then some other interesting um, and novel uh, pharmacologic measures are the idea of a tagant. So here, um, for example, drugs are marked with an inert detectable tagant. You take them, you know, you take the drug, that tagant is, um, is inert, but it actually can be measured by a breath test. And so, um, you know, you, inha you exhale into a, uh, into a monitoring tool and you only, only if you took that drug will you get the, the level. Um, or another idea is to put a sensor in a capsule and then you have to ingest the pill and then you have a, um, a patch on your skin that measures um, that you have ingested the pill. So these are very novel, not necessarily practical for the real world application, but very novel um, pharmacologic measures. So let's talk about hair um, as, as our metric. And, and you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to hair monitoring. Um, this is, we started working on uh, measuring antiretroviral levels in hair in the year 2001, actually. So it has been a long time, but there was an absolute precedent for this. So where did people measure hair levels? Well, they measured in substances like uh, Adam studies, um, and we're, we're starting to get into Adam. Finally, we're starting to get into that now is measuring these drug levels in, in substance uses in hair because we've had, yours was the first request, but we've had so many requests since. But this has been a long time, you know, that the substance use monitoring field has looked at hair levels because, again, you, you could take, you not take your methamphetamine the day before and not have it show up in your urine, but hair levels will give that longer term monitoring if you've used it. The other interesting place, of course, that hair levels have been useful is in forensics analysis. So figuring out if someone died um, from um, the, what you gave them. Um, there was a very interesting story about Napoleon that um, they, they dug up Napoleon's body and he had so much arsenic in his hair that there was a 10-year period where it was thought that, um, that Napoleon had been poisoned on in the, in the island of Elba with arsenic. And then there was a reanalysis where they actually washed his hair and found out that there was, I mean, actually it was shocking how much arsenic was in his hair. There was no way that you could have gotten that from your systemic circulation. And then they washed his hair and then reanalyzed it and the arsenic all went away because what had happened is the hair tonics at the time had a lot of um, arsenic in them. Uh, and so it, it wasn't that he was killed by arsenic uh, poisoning, but it was thought for, for a while from his hair analysis that he was. Um, uh, Beethoven actually uh, probably progressively had lead poisoning and you can detect that in hair. And Newton had a lot of heavy metals um, and uh, in his hair analysis just sort of for environmental exposure. Um, and people think these could have been related to uh, various medical issues that these great um, yeah, scientists and composers had. Uh, the, the other fields in which hair levels are looked at are, for example, epilepsy, um, to look at a longer term metric of looking for adherence for epileptic, anti-epileptic medications, anti-psychotic medications. And then another kind of burgeoning field is looking at um, pollutants in um, hair. So exposure to, for example, um, biphenyl products uh, or other environmental pollutants um, to see if those are accumulating in hair. And then one other application is looking at stress levels, just endogenous cortisol levels are very high in hair um, if there's been a, a chronic stress. And so um, labs have been looking at cortisol levels as a metric of long-term stress in hair. So the advantage of hair, of course, is that it really does provide this, this um, almost area under the curve of area under the curve. So all of this daily variability of plasma levels of day-to-day -day variation is smoothed out by the hair level because it really does give you this longer term metric. It really analyzes um, drug levels that are taken up from the systemic circulation into the plasma over time. Now, in terms of hair levels or advantages and disadvantages, one advantage is it's easy to cut. Do not cut it from the back. I'm sure that's a picture from Miami, um, but it is, it is, um, it has to be collected from the scalp. And I get a lot of questions. Can you can you take the hair from the axillary region or the pubic region? And there is this wonderful aspect about nature is that um, hair does not grow steadily. 
in the axillary or pubic region. It doesn't, um, you know, grow nonstop. It stops, thank God. And so, um, so actually hair levels of drugs in those two regions are not reliable because you want hair to grow continuously to serve as a metric of time. And the only place that hair grows continuously is on the scalp. And it actually grows most steadily in the back of the scalp. So we say to co co collect hair from the occipital portion of the scalp. It is easy to collect. It's, you know, uh, 20 to 30 strands for most antiretrovirals, except for tenofovir, which does take 50 to 100 strands. It's painless in children. Um, and uh, it, it really can be collected even from very short cropped hair um, because we don't need that much hair using our very highly sensitive liquid chromatography tandem mass spec machines. So um, there is advantages. People do hand me hair when we used to see each other in person at Croy all the time. And you can take, um, you know, you can ship it at room temperature um, and it's non-biohazardous. We um, in our lab and other labs um, have used this, we do use this fancy machine. So it is, it is a technique that requires liquid chromatography tandem mass spec, which is um, a very expensive machine. It is, uh, we had to develop our hair levels um, by taking large amounts of hair from highly adherent patients because we needed a lot of hair like shaved heads from people who are taking medications um, to optimize our assays. So we would use a lot of hair, figure out the right um, ways to, to extract that particular drug, Adizanavir, for example, from the hair, and then optimize our assays. And then our assays are actually peer reviewed and passed through the NIH's clinical pharmacology and quality assurance program um, before we put them into the NIH clinical trials networks or any other studies. Um, we have a very um, strict peer review and approval process. Uh, and in terms of the drugs that we can measure in hair, beyond tenofovir and emtricitabine, which is of course useful both for TDF and TAF in, um, in PrEP, um, we can measure uh, efavirin, zatazanavir, nevirapine, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, darunavir, valtegravir, and dolutegravir. And then we have developed methods for the dipivirine vaginal ring. We're actually measuring um, hair levels in our lab now for the HOPE trial, which is the uh, open label extension of the dipivirine vaginal ring for HIV prevention. And we have developed a method for cabotegravir, which we'll talk about later in the talk, um, uh, with the idea of the long-acting uh, PrEP and treatment regimens for hair levels. In terms of the utility of hair levels in treatment, um, it's certainly true that hair levels are a very strong predictor of virologic response. This is data from the WISE study, of which you are a site. Um, and this is published quite some time ago in 2011, but in a multivariate model of all the different predictors of doing well on therapy or not doing well on therapy, hair emerged, hair levels were the strongest independent predictor of treatment outcomes in this large study of, of, of women on Adizanavir at the time. Um, and that has been shown in multiple studies, including um, the ACTG 5257, clinical trial. Um, so that really is the pharmacodynamic relevance of an exposure metric and a pharmacodynamic outcome, which in this case is virologic suppression in treatment trials. We've also shown that hair levels will increase after an adherence intervention. So for example, in the PrEP field, you don't have an RNA level, but you can measure if hair levels increase within the same individual after an adherence intervention. In PrEP, um, hairs have been, hair, have been, hair has been useful, but I think one of the most useful things that we've been looking at is this idea of PrEP breakthroughs. So there are um, certainly um, for those who are in pre-exposure prophylaxis um, and fail PrEP and, and actually break through on pre-exposure prophylaxis, the most likely reason is adherence. But there have been now seven case reports in the literature um, where the breakthrough is actually because of acquired or transmitted drug resistance. So someone got an, um, an M184 mutation containing virus and their PrEP just didn't hold them, uh, unfortunately. And so um, those PrEP breakthroughs, we've been able to help um, unravel the etiology of um, adherence versus resistance by doing segmental drug analysis. And that's where we take the hair level and measure um, adherence in different segments of the hair starting from the scalp over time. So each segment becomes 
a, a metric of the last month of exposure and then what did you do two months ago and then three months ago and then four months ago because hair grows quite steadily at a centimeter per month um, over time in the occipital region and that helps unravel the etiology of these prep failures. Um, so I think it's been, uh, those have been um, very interesting studies and anyone, um, we're going to be working with the CDC to analyze any prep breakthrough in this way. And then the final way that hair levels um, have been useful is actually they can monitor for toxicities because they're a long-term metric of exposure. So this was a study from the iprex Olay study um, that uh, with TDF FTC in men, it looked like age, underlying renal insufficiency, and a hair level of tenofovir were the three most important predictors for having um, a decrease in renal function on TDF FTC in the open label studies of iprex Olay. Um, so that makes sense because the more tenofovir you're exposed to, the more likely you're ha to have renal effects. I think that there are advantages and I think there are disadvantages. The pros of hair levels is that it does grow steadily, interestingly, in the occipit uh, occipital region at this rate of a centimeter a month. It's a long-term metric of exposure. The hair shaft becomes a marker of time, as we talked about. It's easy and cheap to collect. You don't need phlebotomy skills. You could store the hair at room temperature. You, it's non-biohazardous, so you can ship it in regular mail or take it on the plane. Um, and uh, it's feasible for resource-limited settings in that way and not subject to white coat adherence. Um, now, there are the disadvantages which you have seen is that there are acceptability issues with hair collection. We have had more acceptability, actually, in African-based studies, especially among women, than we have in um, MSM, uh, specifically white MSM in this country. Uh, we have actually had good acceptability, for example, in the ATN 110 and 113 studies. These were mainly black, very diverse MSM, black and Latino. Um, and we had a 95% acceptability in that study. But among white MSM, ACGG studies and the PREP um, demo project, we've had less acceptability. Uh, we do try to tell people it's not cosmetically, um, you know, disruptive to the hairstyle. And, and beyond that, if people shave their heads, you know, if you shave it very, very close, then we really can't get hair. And of course, if, there's, if you're bald, we can't get hair. That by definition, um, you know, it, it makes it impossible to collect hair. So that is the biggest con of hair levels, I think, is that you really do require hair on your head for um, collecting hair. On the other hand, I think we have used many tips to try to make it routine. And I think that's why we've had more success in our studies with the field staff in Africa, which is that we have had a lot of success with kind of saying, well, this is less invasive, it's going to happen, warning people that it's going to happen, working within the cultural context about hair levels and what is disturbing um, or not disturbing about collecting hair, um, showing people how small of a sample it, it is, because it really is a small sample. So when we've had pictures or even, um, you know, the actual bag with hair levels of with how much you have to collect, which isn't very much, that's been helpful. Um, and we have had many studies where this has been successful. Um, I, I want to go into, I think, do you, do you do questions at the end? Or do you want to stop? Because now I'm going to go into, um, now I'm going to go into the shorter term metrics. But I wanted to see if you wanted to stop or do I wait and then we go till the end and we'll do questions then. Totally up to you, Monica. Um, if folks have questions, maybe just Post them in we the could chat. stop. This is kind of the, the good stopping point for for longer term metrics and hair, because now I'm going to go on to the shorter term metrics and I'm going to talk about our urine assay that we have. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any. I have a question. Oh, good. Okay. Hi, Deborah. Hi, hi. Um, so, from a practical standpoint, um, in hair collection, because I have a lot of hair. Um, one of the things that we've, not my own, right, not my head, but that we have, uh, we want to send samples through the mail, but we're concerned that the foil on the hair sample is going to create a problem. Can it be stored in plastic without the foil? Yeah, that's a great question. The only reason that we had kind of come up with this idea that you, um, that you put it in foil, and this is actually a picture of the high-tech materials, um, uh, that we require. So it's a pair of scissors, it's a piece of tin foil, and it's this uh, plastic bag. And um, where we got that idea 
is that, uh, you know, when we were actually developing these hair measures, it was really interesting to look at the forensics literature. Like you had to, all the, the studies that we looked at to figure out how to analyze drug levels in hair were from, um, from journals called Forensic Sciences International and FBI Goes Hair. And like there was all, you know, that's really the fields those are the people, it was really the forensics field that were looking at this. And the idea of, of, of taking the hair and putting it in tin foil was to avoid any environmental degradation from high sun exposure on the hair that would maybe break down the products. Um, we have ac actually have not seen evidence of that. For example, um, we have had, uh, we, ha we, are, we are asked to do long-term stability studies in our lab of hair levels that we got like say in 2015 is the hair level still the same in 2020 and um, we have seen no effects of environmental degradation or degradation over time hair levels are so stable drug levels are so stable in time you can dig up bodies um, that are like 2000 you know I don't know about 2000 years but like you can dig up bodies that are hundreds of years old and measure drug levels in those bodies so it really is it's a very stable matrix so yes I'm not worried about tin foil especially temporarily when you're measuring, putting in hair, you can just put it in the plastic and send it. We, people do send us a lot of hair though. When we were doing the ACGG 5257 study, we got like nine, well, it's not even that. We've had like the HOPE study, we have 10,000 samples in our lab from that and they're from all over the world and we haven't had a problem with the mail. We do, we do contain, um, have you put in a letter from the CDC that says this is a non-biohazardous substance, but we haven't seen issues with people sending it through regular mail. So one, one quick question. I see there are some other questions here. Um, our team has decided, they, they read the cortisol paper and they, um, they started talking about substance use. Is it possible for us to use one hair sample um, and look at cortisol, substance use, and antiretroviral? Yeah, I saw this is enough of your needed like 500 or 50 to 100 strands. And, and my other question is why does some stuff need more strands? But could we do all three with the same hair? Yes. Um, so this is a great question. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, you can with one hair sample, you can measure substances, cortisol and antiretrovirals, but you need more hair than uh, than typically collected because cortisol itself takes about 100 strands of hair oh. and then antiretrovirals take about um, 100. So unfortunately you do have to collect like 200 strands of hair. That's the only limitation. Someone like you would be, or me would be no issue. Like 200 strands of hair is like, I mean, I'm always like taking my hair and showing, but it's this, it's like this much. I mean, it's not that much, but like there are people who that is, a, that is daunting. Um, so, uh, but so no doubt you can do it, you, but there's no doubt that you have, that you need more hair. Um, okay. sometimes people have said, okay, I'm going to collect 100 strands from here and 100 strands from here. And I'm going to send those to your lab. We actually have, we have developed a method to measure cortisol in hair because in our field, as you indicate in HIV, chronic stress is a very important thing to measure. So, so what about if you had like one hank of hair, that's my term. Um, and you took the first centimeter for one thing and the next centimeter for another thing. Is that possible? Yes, you could definitely do that. Um, just know that the second centimeter measures your cortisol level right. from right. one That's to two, mo two months ago. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, okay, Thank Mike. you. And just a couple other questions, Monica. Um, Lundita definitely wants to know what the approximate cost is for the assays for, I guess, adherence in here. Yes. So um, we have a very standard rate, which is $126 per hair sample because it's $100 plus they charge a 26% indirect rate. However, not that you've heard it from me or anything, but like I, you know, we give people like, you know, if they're in resource limited settings, it is our lab and we can cut people breaks um, for that. So for example, the way we do that is say, you're analyzing a hundred hair samples and we want to charge you $50 per hair sample, then we can do that. Um, so I do, I, the one advantage of our hair levels is somehow other labs have not um, wanted to do hair. It's actually a, quite a pain to do it. Um, it does require very tiny amounts of hair, very exquisitely sensitive um, balances to measure the milligrams of hair. So it isn't, it isn't I, have, I have lab personnel who have the patients 
who have these incredible patients and they've been working the lab for 15 years, but we haven't had a lot of competition actually. Like not a lot of people want to do hair levels. It's not easy. So because of that, and, and also our hair levels are passed through the NIH and, um, you know, very strict controls. So we kind of have a, in a way we have a monopoly on hair levels. So I'll give you a deal if you want to do it, but it's $126 per hair sample by the official UCSF uh, uh, quote. And then the last one here is from John uh, Razier. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, John. He just wants to know about um, what reasons MSM might not want or be able to give hair, and if there are uh, confounds like dyes, spray, mousse that affect the samples. Yes. Um, it could be that we didn't do a good enough job to reassure people that it wouldn't be, in a way, any disruptive. A lot of people keep their hair really short was another issue. There is male pattern baldness that occurs in the world, um, and that and that uh, that could be even though you can get it from the sides. Um, I I feel like we did not work. I feel like it has a lot to do with field staff. Like if you can get the field staff on board with the collection, um, and they say that this is part of your study, as opposed to saying this is so weird, this is optional. Like I, I feel like in the IPREXLA and the prep demo projects, we didn't work hard enough to make it a routine part of the study. And I, I, it doesn't mean that there's some inherent reason that white MSM would not want to give hair. I think it is a matter of like gaining the trust of participants and um, with getting more um, familiarity that that would be an aspect of it. Um, but somehow we've had more luck in, in, in actually women in Africa uh, than we have with white MSM in our trials. I think that's it in terms of questions so far. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the urine assay. Um, so, you know, the thing about, I've just tried to convince you that, you know, hair levels are great because they're longer term metrics of adherence. That doesn't actually mean that, um, that, uh, that, that short term metrics of adherence are out the window, but we have to be aware of their cons. And we had to be aware of their pros as well. So the thing about short-term metrics of adherence, um, and plasma is a short-term metric. Plasma tells you your drug-taking behavior over the last two to four days, say, at the most seven days. Um, the plasma levels of tenofovir were the gold standard metric in all of the major clinical trials for PrEP, Partners PrEP, TDF2, IPREX, FEMPREP, FOIS. Why? Because we had plasma levels. People had collected plasma as part of the trial. People hadn't, you know, thought about hair to do in voice or fem prep. It wasn't part of the trial design. And so, um, and really you can see that the efficacy on the left-hand side was the plain out efficacy if you didn't put in drug levels and the efficacy could be interpreted as we talked about before with putting in the plasma levels in partners prep, even your efficacy increased even though partners prep had very good efficacy even without the drug levels and all of this, you know, really sort of plasma levels explained what happened into these different clinical trials for PrEP. So plasma levels were an important metric in the PrEP clinical trials. And that means that we can't discount that short-term measures aren't important. Now, the problem with getting a plasma level, hair level, DBS measure, any of these measures is none of these can be real time. You cannot take a hair level, run to the back of the room do this very complicated LCMS-MS analysis and then come back panting three hours later and say, hey, you have a good hair level, let me counsel you on hair levels. And so the idea is, could we get a metric that is a real-time metric of adherence? And so we started looking, and this was a couple of years ago now, at was there a way to look at a tenofovir level in urine, for example, as a metric of PrEP and treatment in real time? Now, nothing, uh, that, met, that uses mass spectrometry can be a real-time metric. It, it will always take a little bit of time to use that machine. Um, it, it may take, a, you know, if you get lucky and you have kind of a, um, like a um, benchtop uh, spectrometry method, uh, Pete Anderson and others are looking at this with DBS, you can get it in a, in a, in a short uh, turnaround time. But um, we, we actually wanted to look at a different way, not be by mass spectrometry, but by, for example, an antibody-based test to look at tenofovir. Why antibodies? Because um, it, it, it was, it's like a urine pregnancy test. Uh, an antibody will 
enable you to do, for example, in a urine, um, in a urine sample, look for tenofovir right away, do a dip test, for example, or pee on a stick, essentially, and get a tenofovir level answer, yes or no, right there in real time. Now, it wasn't easy um, to, to think of that, actually, because developing antibodies that are highly specific and sensitive um, for a compound is not something that um, is that not something that is easy to do in a laboratory like ours, which was a mass spec level uh, level uh, uh, laboratory. Um, but we ended up having to work with a company, uh, in this case Abbott, to help develop an antibody. And how did we do that? Well, we looked at the tenofovir molecule, and um, I don't actually have a study of that, but we looked at the molecule and really scrutinized it and looked at, um, and I'm, by the molecule I mean tenofovir, and we looked at what it looked like and tried to find haptins or antigens to develop an antibody against that were very unique. What makes tenofovir look very different than your endogenous um, DNA, for example? You don't, it, tenofovir actually resembles a uh, nucleotide adenine, but we needed to look for particular elements of the molecule that were very specific to tenofovir and then raise an antibody against that haptin. And so um, we scrutinized the molecule, we figured out some haptins, they injected these antigens, in, they, um, they designed these antigens and they, and they injected it into rabbits. And every month we'd call them and they'd say, nothing yet, nothing yet. And then suddenly out of the blue, we got an amazing antibody against Dinovivir. And now um, we've done a lot of studies uh, using that antibody. Um, the idea of wanting a point of care test is of course, um, to be able to counsel people in real time. Um, the idea here is that you can dip a urine level, know if someone has Dinovivir in there and you can trigger feedback or maybe send a viral load if it's in treatment or triggered adherence intervention right then and there. Um, peer support, pill boxes, counseling, motivational interviewing, differentiated care, everything can be done there on site. So that would be the advantage of developing a point of care metric for tenofovir. So once we got our antibody, then we took um, uh, uh, people who you know were getting DOT um, with tenofovir because every time you before you figure out the cutoff, and we've done this with our hair levels, and, and Pete Anderson has done this with the tenofovir diphosphate levels in DBS, you need to figure out the appropriate cutoff at which um, someone definitely uh, took tenofovir in the last couple of days. So the way to do cutoff, to figure out that cutoff, that threshold um, of exposure is to do a DOT study. So working with Paul Drain at the University of Washington, this was a directly observed study where um, HIV non-infected volunteers were given tenofovir at two, four, seven doses a week. And then you actually um, measure their urine levels and we were able to calculate and model what's the appropriate cutoff that classified 98% of those who took the dose within 24 hours. And then we've done a bunch of other studies that really looked at the urine level by the antibody assay um, and compared it to both ELISA. Um, so the antibody assay um, has now been developed in what's called a lateral flow assay. That is the assay that um, looks exactly like this. This is the assay we have in our lab. And it's a dipstick. So they've actually, um, the company has put it onto a matrix such that you can really just take a drop of urine put it into this little divot like a pregnancy test, and then the urine test goes across um, the field and it lights up if you have tenofovir in your urine. And then we had to, um, to analyze that test in relationship to a typical, um, what's called a LISA test, and that's the AIDS, uh, the AIDS paper down here. And then we had to compare the, um, the urine test both by the ELISA and this um, lateral flow assay to liquid chromatography tandem mass spec levels that we've done in our lab. And that's the Jade's paper down here. That should be Jade's. And so at any rate, at this point, we have now packaged this urine test. It is in a lateral flow assay format. It is a rapid strip test. We've figured out the cutoff that's associated with um, uh, high sensitivity and specificity, which is a 1500 nanograms per mil of having tenofovir in your urine. It takes about 60 seconds to develop it and it really was a collaboration uh, between our laboratory and uh, the Abbott Rapid Diagnostics Group. 
Um, and now our next step is to put this urine assay into a variety of prevention and treatment studies. We are about to launch a study in Kenya um, where we will test the intervention of providing real-time adherence feedback to women on PrEP um, who are in non-serodiscordant couples. And we will randomize half of the women to standard adherence counseling and half of the women to getting this feedback of their urine test and then um, look at their um, hair levels because that's our longer term metric of adherence at three, six, nine, and 12 months after starting PrEP. And at each of those four time points, we're giving adherence feedback with the urine test and doing adherence counseling in the context of an objective adherence metric. And we will see if women who um, are able to look at their test and get counseling in the context of an objective adherence metric um, uh, do increase their long-term adherence over time. Uh, and that has been shown in, in some other studies with plasma measures that, it, that having that ability to give this real-time metric um, could be helpful. And, and we're also doing some treatment studies. Uh, and then I'll end with um, the longer-term metrics of adherence. Um, uh, sorry, the long-acting drugs. I just want to mention something that I think will be really interesting to do with long-acting drugs that we're trying to work with in our lab, which is um, we're all very excited about cabotegravir and ropivirine coming out, both as um, given together for treatment, and then also cabotegravir giving as a long-acting drug every two months for prevention. And this was the Atlas 2M study that was presented at CROI 2020 virtually. And you can see that, you know, just even giving two months of the cabotegravir ropivirine was associated with high rates of virologic suppression compared to giving every four weeks. But the Achilles heel of these long-acting regimens is when you stop the therapy or when you go too long, you have this very long pharmacokinetic tail, cabotegravir and ropivirine both. And you don't want to be in a situation where you don't dose people in time and they can get into having selective drug pressure of a lowish level of cabotegravir. Um, and so one thing that we're trying to work on with this company, though they're very busy uh, now with COVID, unfortunately we haven't been able to get them to engage, but we were, prior to this, they were gonna help us work on a cabotegravir antibody um, so that if we could get a dipstick with um, a urine level of cabotegravir, we could say, oh, um, you, you need to be redosed a little earlier than eight weeks or you could maybe even go out to nine, 10 weeks with your, um, with your uh, prep um, cabotegravir. So I think pharmacokinetic monitoring and the setting of, these, of this tail and the inter-individual inter variability um, among people with what their cabotegravir levels look like could be very helpful. Um, so in conclusion, pharmacologic measures really have been a very interesting metric that I think our field has advanced more than any other field. Um, we are more advanced in pharmacologic monitoring in HIV um, than any field except for, I think, substance use monitoring, where there really is a, a great uh, focus on both urine and hair metrics of substances. Um, there is this advantage of the longer term metrics that they give you a cumulative metric of adherence, and then there's a disadvantage that you can't do them in real time. So I think hair has, met, has um, advantages, and I think urine levels have advantages. And I think the biggest advantages of the hair level, of the urine level, um, is that you can do it right then and there in the clinic, in the research setting. And the disadvantage is um, that it's not a long-term metric. So remember that you can take uh, your pill the day before and your urine metric will look like you've been adherent. And it really is the combination of long and, long and short-term metrics, at least in research studies, that give us a sense of the patterns of adherence. So I'll stop there and thank my lab um, and uh, see if you have any remaining questions. Awesome. Any other questions about uh, Dr. Gandhi's work, either the hair, the urine, maybe next to saliva, Monica? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's very interesting. We are looking at, um, from that same DOT study in Thailand, we did have saliva samples. So we are going to look at saliva because um, this particular company also is, has an HIV antibody test with saliva. And so they're very interested in looking at seeing if saliva can measure, measure adherence. Oh, nice. Yeah, and drug use, it's a marker of very, very recent adherence, uh, I guess, use, rather. 
Exactly. I mean, I think you're right that, you know, you, you and others have been asking us for a long time about substances. Um, and I think one advantage of urine is that if you wanted to do a study where you already have all the urine metrics of substances, because those are all well developed. And by the way, those are all antibody tests as well. Methamphetamine, cocaine, those are all antibody tests. Mm -hmm. um, at least the dipsticks are. Um, those, you can do urine at the same time, see if you have tenofovir and see if you have um, substances and then think of it adherent. I mean, you're doing this, but, um, and then hair measures. I think we do need to come up with a way to measure tenofovir and cocaine and whatnot all in the same metric. And we're starting to do that work now after resisting it for some time, just because it was mm -hmm. more complicated, but we're starting to do it now. Yeah, and uh, Steve uh, was asking about whether or not there is some possibility in the future that urine will serve as a long-term biomarker. Um, I don't think it can. I, I think, you know, that the urine and plasma um, really only measure short-term adherence. Like your plasma level, for example, you can, um, you know, you, you, you collect it and, 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 and your drug level will wash out um, seven days after you take it. So there's just an inherent property of these two biomatrices that they won't be able to do it. So it does make it harder for patterns of adherence. You have to collect both. That, yeah. That's why it's always a pro and con question for your study, which one to do. We do both, but in real world, it's, I wish that could happen. And I guess, um, I mean, you found that the urine uh, marker of uh, PrEP adherence predicts zero conversion, right? So to the extent that your recent uh, adherence reflects a trait-like pattern of adherence, you're good to go, <laughs> right? But yes, it's a, that's, it's yes. No, that's a great question. We just published a paper in CID about um, looking back at time and the partner's prep study and urine levels because they had collected urine for creatinine monitoring for, for renal toxicity. So luckily they had urine. Urine spot metrics of a tonofovir were strongly predicted of seroconversion. Um, this white coat adherence issue in PrEP is a very important issue. We have not seen white coat adherence with plasma metrics, actually, even when people in PrEP trials knew that their plasma levels could be used to measure levels. So even the white coat adherence is definitely a theoretical possibility that hadn't been seen in the PrEP trials. All right. Well, Monica, it's been a pleasure having you and um, just seeing all of uh, this exciting work. And I'm sure you're creating a lot more work for yourself now because yeah. people are reaching out. But if anyone wants to use urine measures, we have them for free in our lab. Um, and I'm serious. We can put them in your study. So contact me. Awesome.